listening to Coffee and Conversation with Recovery Advocate Network, the nonprofit organization that strives to address the staggering disparity in resource availability for individuals suffering from mental health disorders, processing disorders, addictions, trauma healing, and sexual identity challenges. Together, we strive to end the stigma associated with these challenges so that true healing can begin. Welcome back to Coffee and Conversation with Recovery Advocate Network. I'm your host, Ange, and welcome you to episode number 12. Today's podcast focuses on boundaries and why they are so scary. We are thrilled to have our guest, Cherise, here to share her expertise. This episode mentions various mental health challenges as well as religious influences. We realize some listeners may have experienced abuse through religion, so we want to include this in our episode trigger warning. If you feel triggered by any of the topics mentioned, we encourage you to contact your support system, therapist, national and community support groups, the Global Crisis Text Line by texting 741-741, and or, if in the United States, dialing 988 to reach the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. So, what are we waiting for? Fill up your coffee and let's get started. Welcome, listeners. I am very excited today to have a guest talking about one of my favorite topics. In fact, if you have worked with me or you're a friend of mine, you're a colleague, you've heard me talk about boundaries. Specifically, I have the book Boundaries by Townsend Cloud behind me. I live my life by it. My favorite sentence in the book is no is a complete sentence. And I try and tell people you only have so many yeses. So every time you say yes for something, you're automatically saying no to something else. So choose your yeses wisely. And so I'll start off with Sharice welcoming you to the podcast. And first off saying thank you for saying yes to this, because I know you had other things that you probably could spend your time doing on a Saturday. So I'm honored that you're here. And now I'm going to do my traditional shut up and let you introduce yourself and tell us why you're here. Okay, thanks. So yes, I'm thrilled that I got to say yes to this. And the boundaries book is in my personal notes that I kind of made little chicken scratch for today's episode. Boundaries book by the Cloud and Townsend is on one of my pages. And that was probably my first real introduction to this topic. So this is also one of my favorite topics. So yes, I am Erin Sharice Golf. I go by Sharice because my first name is spelled A-A-R-O-N, which can be quite confusing. And so the name in general is confusing, but Sharice Golf, and I'm a licensed professional counselor. I've been licensed since 2008, but I've been in the field since closer to 2005. So I got into the field very young, very naive, and I've done a lot of my learning and growing over that time period. So thanks so much for having me here. I love your mission. I know one of the board members personally, and they are very passionate about the mission and it shows. And so I've been supporting the foundation since you guys started. Well, first off, thank you for that support. Every bit of support makes a huge difference. I'll make my plug for the audience. I say this in the outro, but I'll say it again. Everyone who volunteers Everyone involved in RAN is 100% volunteer. So we all have other jobs. We volunteer time. So every amount of contribution is going towards the mission to help individuals. I'm very proud of that and very excited to allow the podcast to help also with that mission. So that's great. So boundaries, yes. And with your experience, maybe kick us off. Tell us a little bit about why you got into the field perhaps why you navigated toward this idea today to share on the topic of boundaries. Why are you so passionate about it? And what do you think society really needs to hear about it? Of course. Yeah, that's a great place to start. So I got into the field 
almost as an avoidance of something that I did not like, which when I look back over my life in general, that's a lot of, a lot of my decisions have been made is I don't like this. So it pushes me towards something else. I originally graduated with my undergrad in communications. I thought maybe I would be a pharmaceutical rep because that was kind of the hot field at the time. It was early 2000s and that was a field that lots of females were getting into and they made lots of money. It was something that in the small town that I lived in for most of my life that was available to me. And so that was the direction I originally thought that I would go in. I got into the business world, um, not that specific field, but the business world in general. And I just could never put my finger on why that it just was not for me, but I was miserable. I mean, I was, I was crying in my car at lunchtime. I didn't even gamble and I was buying lottery tickets just hoping that I would win the lottery to get me out of this misery that I was experiencing. And so I finally went probably about a year or more in, I went to a career counselor in my local town and I just said, Hey, something's wrong. And he taught, he spoke with me for about an hour. He was actually a licensed professional counselor. And he said, I think you would be good at this job. And it blew me away. I didn't know what to make of it. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps now even talking about it. I mean, it was such a life altering experience to have somebody say that. And so I said, well, I don't even know what what this job does. I've I've never no one in my family has really been to counseling. I don't even know what this looks like. What do you even do? I don't have the right education. And so he explained what I would need to do. And it was go back to school and get my graduate degree, which was a huge commitment of time and money and a whole career change. And so I did that. And the first semester, I mean, I loved every class. I just, I couldn't get enough. So here I am. That's where this got started. And I've really never looked back. I have goosebumps as well. I, I love this because I was, I was just talking with this high school student yesterday that wants to intern at my company. And I was sharing with him about how I find so many younger individuals think that whatever whatever they decide to major in in college is going to set their whole life or whatever their first job is out of college is going to be the pivotal moment and the rest of their life is off of that. And I do a lot of mentoring at Georgia Tech and those seniors, those fourth years, I keep saying to them, look, if you get out and you start doing something and you don't like it, you've learned how to solve problems. So just use those core skills that you have. And this personally touches me because I actually worked in finance for a number of years and I hated it. I was really good at it and I absolutely hated it. And I remember when I decided to quit work, go back to school to get my degree in biomedical engineering. And I actually went back to school as a 29 year old single mom with a special needs daughter at Georgia Tech. And I remember that first semester sitting in those classes Mm -hmm. of biomedical engineering and saying, wow, this is what I'm meant to be. And so thank you so much for sharing that, because I just think if the world would realize you're going to spend a lot of time working, do something you love and you're passionate about it, be brave about that. So so that is awesome. Okay, so you decided to go back to grad school and loved it and clearly still love it because you're on the podcast today talking about one of the topics. So what did you get into next when you transitioned out? Maybe tell us what that journey looked like. So I originally was into grad school. And I mean, I I went in full force. I was already married. I got married young. I got married at 22. Um, We met at 19. And so I was married living in our first little starter home. And we did not make a ton of money at that time. It was actually kind of right before the housing crash. I mean, it was in, in that period of time. And so being that age and trying to get started is always a struggle, but certain periods in, of time are extra struggling. So this was more probably 2004, 2005. So after 2011, a couple of years after that. So basically, I asked my husband, can I do this full time until I can start making money doing it? And so I was lucky or blessed enough to be able to do that. And so I got to really dedicate a couple of years to it. And then that put me into internship time. And so I don't know how much of the audience is aware of what it takes to become a licensed professional counselor, but it's a couple of years of graduate school, at least if you can do it full time. And then during that and somewhat after that, it is many, many, many hours of direct 
counseling or observation or paperwork related to the field. And you've got to find a place to do that. And you've got to find someone to supervise you. And then once you're licensed, many, many more hours of supervision, which is necessary. And I'm, I'm very glad that the field has that available. And that's the way that the training is. It does not make it easy for someone coming into the field to do, which anyone can attest to when they go in this as a second career, which is very common. So I began working with children, at-risk families, very typical coming into this field. You work with a, a high acuity population. It's one of the only fields where the least trained people work with the highest or one of the highest acuities of population. The, the population of people that are going to have the some of the deepest issues and concerns, multi-layered issues, at-risk families and youth. And so I spent many years doing doing that first. I was going to ask you to define what high acuity is. I will admit, when I first heard years ago the phrase high acuity, I thought in my head, I thought, oh, smart people. And that's not what high acuity means at all. So <laughs> can you talk about what those levels are for treatment, how individuals are put into one category or the next? Absolutely. So acuity basically means the severity of whatever is going on. So when someone comes to outpatient counseling, which is you go to your local therapist office, you go in there for an hour, usually your insurance pays for it, or you pay for it yourself with, with cash and you leave, that is the what's called the lowest level of care. So that type of counseling and therapy that's available basically to anyone who wants it or who can afford it is the lowest level of care. And then you move up. There's partial hospitalization called PHP. There's inpatient hospitalization after that. So that's, you know, residential. You are staying there. The higher levels would be higher acuity. So treatment centers where we're going to stay, the acuity is higher. When I say I was working with a high acuity population, they were not in treatment but the risk factors were severe. So lots of poverty, lots of history of abuse of all kinds, several children maybe in a home at one time, maybe lack of transportation. Oftentimes the food quality was low or lack of food. So high acuity in the way that I'm saying it is just so many risk factors present at one time. And then a young new therapist coming, I was coming into the home. So I was driving my own car there and I was coming into the homes and I was sitting on the couches. And sometimes, you know, there were interesting critters crawling across my leg. And, and I was doing therapy the best that I knew how with my training in that in that environment for many years. Wow, that that is amazing. Thank you for walking us through that journey, because that really enlightens a lot. And I. It also makes me wonder how many young ther or young to the practice therapists go through that and say, okay, I can't handle this, or I'm not prepared mm -hmm. for this, or this is way above and beyond, or what even that a mental baggage they need to take home and try and deal with afterwards. That did you feel that in it? Did you feel like you were set up for success? And I guess maybe a little pivot, our conversation, we're going to get to boundaries. I promise listeners, we're going to get to boundaries. But now I'm I'm super curious, hearing this from you, did you feel like you were set up for success? And if not, is there any advice or any change you would like to see in how individuals are brought into the training process to set them up for more success than perhaps you received? Well, I will link boundaries into this because... A lot of times in specific therapy settings, such as that one, or when you're working with children, or when you're working in certain agencies where the expectation is really almost more than one person can provide in, in a 40-hour work week, boundaries are not encouraged. Boundaries are discouraged because you got to do what you got to do to get the job done. And your personal life or your self-care is oftentimes... It, it has to be put to the side or you think it has to be put to the side or the people that come into this type of profession being a helping profession, we have a heart to help, are already wired to put our own needs to the side. And so boundaries are, are even more difficult than in a lot of other professions where it's expected that you're going to take all the vacation in a year or it's expected that you are going to you know leave at a certain time. 
where in helping professions, a lot of times that can be looked at either by the helper themselves or by other people as cold, unkind, not compassionate. And so boundaries were not really even something that myself or my colleagues talked about very often, if at all. And if we were talking about it, I don't think we were probably using that terminology at that particular time. That's so true. So why don't we go into some of the notes that you have that you prepared for boundaries? Where should we start? Absolutely. So I think I will just circle back to the book that you talked about that's on your shelf, because I recommend that book, probably one of the most frequent of any books. Specifically where I'm from, I've grown up in the South. I've always lived in the Bible Belt. I live in the Bible Belt currently in Mississippi. And most of my clientele is going to have some level of background, spiritual background of Christian faith, typically. And so that particular book does incorporate that. And I think for people in general, just general population, but absolutely people really of any faith, but definitely of Christian faith. Boundaries do not feel like the right thing to do. They feel unkind. They feel unchristian. They feel mean. People get irritated when we start setting boundaries, especially if we've never done it before. When I read the boundaries book, and I couldn't tell you now how I got my hands on it or or why I ended up picking it up, but it was mine. I must have purchased it. When I got that book, I think that I read the whole book in a day. Because I was mind blown. I did not even know I was allowed to do the things that that book talked about. I didn't, I mean, I can remember reading this book and getting into chapter two or three and the boundary myths and why it's okay to do and why it's healthy to do, why it's better and appropriate to do. And my, my brain could barely take in the information. It just was so new to me. And I was already in my early 30s. I'd been married probably about 10 years. I already had two children. I had been in the therapist or counseling profession at this point for at least a handful of years. And this was a very new concept to me. And so I have been down this road of boundaries for about 10 years now, maybe a little more. And I would title myself as far as being in recovery. I have said this many times. If I'm in recovery from anything, it's codependency recovery. I am absolutely a recovering codependent. I think that will be um, lifelong work. It's something that I do not consider myself an expert in, but I think I'm getting closer to that title (laughs) because I've been doing it now for so long, both personally and professionally. That's a lot of hours in a day or a week, learning about boundaries, struggling to figure out how that concept fits into my daily life and my relationships and my personal beliefs. And so that that ultimately is kind of the foundation of how I even understand the word. I love that. So, okay. What are some of your favorite lessons that you've taken back from the book? And maybe some of what are some of the myths? What are some of the things that you thought, wow, I never realized I had permission to do X, Y, and Z. What are some of those you'd like to share with the audience? I think that, and and I even made this note, I mean, I'm by no means a biblical scholar of any sort, but again, I mean, being raised in the Bible Belt, I was, I was raised in a highly conservative church. That's not the church that I've attended much in my adulthood, but that was, that was my upbringing. And so that developed a lot of my core beliefs or what I thought to be the right way of living. And so I think the boundaries book just played out that there's another way. There's another way to do life and and do relationships and and think about yourself involved in that that is healthier and better. I don't think I even understood fully the term enabling because I didn't understand boundaries. And those two things really just go hand in hand. If you don't understand how to say no or when to set a limit or what a boundary even is. And so the way I think of a boundary is usually I think of it as like a door or a gate. It can be closed. It can be locked. It can be wide open. It can swing back and forth. It can be cracked a little bit. I mean, we've got some choices in how we keep our backyard, which is sort of how I look at my life, keep our backyard gated or wide open to the public. And and to me, that is what boundaries look like. And so I think that the biblical piece of it that just helped me accept this and say, this is okay, is the piece that says, 
It's in Mark. I think it's in chapter five. And it's something to the effect of let your yes be yes and your no be no. And basically it goes on to kind of talk about anything else is manipulative. And I think that one of your previous guests, maybe a couple episodes ago, she was a, a counselor in the mental health field. And she talked about the trauma responses and not having boundaries is oftentimes the fawn response out of those four trauma responses, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. A lot of people haven't even heard of fawn. Not having boundaries or feeling very guilty or anxious for setting boundaries oftentimes is that response. It's the fawn response. And that goes into lots of nervous system dynamics and anxiety and hypervigilance and all of these things that ultimately produce codependency or lack of boundaries or make us easy to take advantage of or manipulate from other people who may or may not be maliciously trying to do so. So I think just realizing that there is a true support, both from the mental health aspect and a faith-based aspect, that boundaries are okay and even healthy. That That's my main takeaway from that book, if I had to sum it up, and that book has a lot in it. Yes. So you're referring to Janine. She talked about the trauma response in episode eight, which was living beyond mental illness and therapy burnout. Phenomenal episode. I just love Janine. She's amazing. We also talked about the fawn response in episode seven, where Rainbow talked about her gender identity challenges and mental health illnesses. And knowing rainbow and having hearing her say that that is her gut response to stuff tied to trauma from her childhood was a little shocking to me because externally knowing her I just see her as having these phenomenal boundaries and so it it made me realize that sometimes our internal struggles that we have aren't relate on the outside. And so individuals may think, oh, we really have everything together and, and this is where we are. But internally, we have these internal battles. And I think that internal ba- battle of codependence, I hear that a lot in addiction recovery. It seems to be so tied into addiction recovery as well as challenges with codependence. And so how? what do you think the individual who is perhaps struggling with codependence or struggling with boundaries internally What do you think some of those stories are that they're saying to themselves in their head that are actually maybe inaccurate or defeative? And I I ask this question because I assume in the audience, we're going to have some individuals who maybe have great boundaries and some who don't. And so I really want the ones who do have good boundaries to be able to understand the internal struggle of someone who struggles with it. Because to me, my sponsor in one of my programs said to me the other day, he was like, I love, you have like phenomenal boundaries. He was trying to get me to do something. I was like, absolutely not. I'm not doing it. And he kept trying to. I was like, no. And he goes, I just love your boundaries. And so to me for a while, I didn't understand why it was so challenging for other people to say no and to use these boundaries. So it really helped me to learn a little bit about what that internal struggle is for someone. So can you kind of try and describe what that is for listeners? Absolutely. So I'm going to use a, an example that actually just occurred a couple of hours ago. My husband and I typically have coffee outside on Saturday mornings. That's sort of our little time that we've found to reconnect after the week. You know, we're both awake and we've had a good night's sleep. And, you know, it's just a good time to sort of hang out or chat or cover whatever may have happened that we didn't talk about. And we're sitting out there just this morning. And I was telling him about a phone conversation that I have had this week with a, a man that I did not know, but I had a question that I was trying to ask. And it, it could have been a very brief conversation. And this particular person on the other end of the phone, um, and this was this was not a, related to my counseling practice. This was just like a personal question that I that I had to ask. He went into lots of other information and got very passionate about what he was talking about. And I've said several different times that at least three. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm low on time. I've, I've got to get off here. And then the con- oh, I know, I know. And the conversation just kept going. And I'm getting more and more frustrated inside because I'm not being heard. I'm not being listened to. I'm starting to feel disrespected. And I'm attempting to say it more assertively. Hey, you know, I really got to get off here. I'm running late for my next you know, appointment. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and just really overpowering me on the phone. And again, I do not know this person personally, so I don't even have like a relational connection to them. But my internal struggle 
because I was getting distressed and upset and frustrated, I was getting low on time and I was now starting to run late. It took my brain to more of a default place, which is kind of what I call like our early programming. It took my brain to that place of, I, I can't just get off here. I have to wait until this person is done speaking. I have to be respectful. You know, my, my needs matter less than their needs. If they really need to get this out and say this, then it doesn't matter if I'm running five minutes behind. And so all of my default programming came out. And I'm telling my husband just the story about, you know, I couldn't get off the phone. And my goodness, I would have had to darn near hang up on the man. And my husband, who doesn't struggle with boundaries near to the level that I do, said, why didn't you just hang up? And I just looked at him like he was an alien, like that, that wasn't even an option for me. It wasn't even something, I mean, I said it as in I would have had to darn near hang up, but that was just a statement I was making. That wasn't in my mind, even an option that I truly had. And so I said, well, I'm not just going to hang up. I mean, how do you think that's going to land to the other person? And that right there defines everything that we're talking about. It didn't matter as much what I needed. It mattered how it would make the other person feel. And so this is my ongoing struggle 10 years into this and pushing 20 years in the field that I'm in and teaching this regularly day after day. This is still something that I have to be intentional about because it's not my default programming. My default programming are things like, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. My default programming is saying no is mean. People get upset. People get mad. It makes people uncomfortable. That's wrong. You should not do that. And so I'm having to relay, rewire programming in my brain, my body, my spirit, all parts of myself that say something different from the core programming that I have from either just how I'm wired as a person or the way that I was brought up and, and honestly, just a combination of both of those things. Okay. So I love that example. And I will say to your husband, I was thinking the same thing. I would be like, you know what? Sorry. Got to go talk later. Hang up. And yet mm -hmm. I love hearing you share that internal struggle because it really just gives me insight into that. And I think Listeners, if you're listening and you don't struggle with boundaries, play this, like rewind and listen to this again, because I guarantee you, you have maybe employees that report to you or other individuals you're trying to mentor. And the more you can understand their internal struggle you have, the more effective a leader, the more effective of a partner you can be. And I don't mean that in a manipulative way. So I don't mean that in a way of saying, I know this individual is not going to say no, therefore I'm going to take advantage of them. That is the exact opposite of what we want. So you have someone come in to your therapy room and you're talking with them and you realize, okay, this individual really struggles with boundaries and it manifests negatively in these areas of their lives. Do you have any particular stories or examples of how what that would look like that you could share that would maybe allow listeners who might still be thinking, I don't really understand this word boundaries they keep talking about? Sure. People come in most frequently for anxiety, depression, and some form of trauma. So whether that would be diagnosable, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, or more likely, and this is not a current active diagnosis, but our field is moving more toward this. CPTSD, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which basically just means instead of having one or two large life events happen that have been traumatic, it's many, many, many small things over the course of time that ultimately produce very similar symptoms. The main symptom that I see that really indicates that codependency, lack of boundaries, maybe just a lack of understanding how to even set boundaries or what they are is hypervigilance. So that is when I am just on high alert almost all the time. And that can manifest in all kinds of ways. Somebody comes in and just says, you know, well, I'm sitting on the couch and, you know, I just turned the TV on and my spouse walks in the door and I immediately feel like I have to get up and start doing something before they even make it in the, in the door from the garage. I'm in the kitchen scrubbing dishes. 
I am feeding the dog. I am hopping up, up to, to look on my phone or to get on my computer really quickly. That is hyper vigilance of I can't just be me. I just can't be authentic and, and have a rest and sit down and relax because I should be doing something different. Someone expects something different of me or I, I perceive that this other person expects something different of me. They may not even mind at all. They may come in and, and not pay a bit of attention to what we're doing, but we perceive that they expect something different. And so we are hyper vigilant to that. We're very highly attuned to that. Our physical bodies are aware. Our emotional state is aware. All of our thoughts go to that. So again, it's my perceived thought of their wants or needs or preferences overrides my own desire for relaxation or my own just personal being that I can sit here for five minutes because that is okay. Other people's perceived, what I perceive their desires to be overrides my needs. That That's the key right there. What I think someone else wants or prefers ultimately overrides my own needs, which circles back to that personal story that I shared about getting off the phone. I needed to get off the phone. Internally, I was struggling with how the other person on the other end of the phone, who I've never even met, would feel if I got off the phone in a way that felt too direct. That's a great example. Okay, so the individual comes in and they're struggling and, and they have these issues that you're you're talking about or these struggles that are really keeping them from living a full life. My personal quote is when you were born, you were given one life to live. You were given one opportunity to be yourself, build a legacy and make a difference to make it count. And I think boundaries, not utilizing boundaries, take away that opportunity to be yourself and build your own legacy and to be able to make it count in the best that you can, because it kind of hijack your own authentic self is what you were saying. So if I were to come in and start working with you and struggle with some of these things, what are some of the tools you would like, how would you give me baby steps into learning to practice boundaries or learning to stop that default mechanism when it's in high drive and transition to something that would allow me to be more authentic? That's a great point. Yes. The lack of boundaries, either knowing what they are, how to set them, how to keep them, or a lot of times just the distress that they cause to even consider putting this, you know, saying no or starting to identify or think about my own needs. That causes so much guilt and distress and anxiety that people don't want to do it. The title that we talked about, why are boundaries so scary? That's why they're so scary. They feel scary. If we are not used to saying no or thinking about our own needs or doing what is best for us, the quality of life that we are living over over time, it just erodes more and more and more. I mean, it just chips away at the self. It And people come in oftentimes into counseling. And I think the first line of my online profile for, for therapists, where people, if they were to look at my name, they would see this. I think it says something to the effect of, do you want to enjoy your life? In It's such a short blurb. I don't mention in that blurb codependency or boundaries because those are, you know, jargon. Those are therapeutic jargon that, uh, you know, oftentimes people don't even know what I would be getting at. But I am getting at this. I am getting at it strips away the quality of your life. It makes you feel, makes us feel, me feel like less of a person, like I don't matter, like everyone else is more important. You see this often with women. Men as well. Men struggle in these areas as well. Sometimes it looks different. But often with women, absolutely often with women in motherhood, because our children's needs do take precedence, especially early in childhood, their needs are more important. They have to be met first. And so we can fall into these patterns, even if we had boundaries earlier in life. I had great boundaries for the most part as a teenager and in probably even into early adulthood, I think whenever I became a wife and a mother, the way I thought that was supposed to look, in addition to some traumas I had experienced, in addition just to how I'm built as a person, put me into this state of my needs don't matter. And then I didn't quite know how to come back from that because I didn't have the language for it. And I was never taught boundaries. I just kind of knew how to do it in earlier stages of life. And so the, it's funny that you mentioned the quote, because 
when you asked me about the quote that that I kind of lean to, it is be courageous and be kind. And the reason that I have that quote is because it's so easy for me to be kind or what I think is kind, probably more nice, probably nice is the better word. And nice and kind are two different things. It's easy for me to be kind. It's I have to be very courageous to be courageous and kind. So to me, that indicates boundaries. If I'm courageous and kind, I am saying yes when I mean yes. I'm saying no when I mean no. I'm being my authentic self more of the time. Again, in that movie, there's a another great quote. It says, this is perhaps the greatest risk any of us will ever take to be seen as we truly are. That's what boundaries ultimately do. And that is scary. It's very vulnerable until we get more used to how that feels. It is so scary. At the same point, it's so beautiful. It is so beautiful because every individual is so unique. I love when I've gotten to know someone and they've been vulnerable with me and they've shared some of those those traits that are very unique to themselves that they've kind of hidden away. And when I start to see them blossom, it just, I mean, my heart just explodes because I love seeing this individual as being their own true self, not a carbon copy of somebody else, but who they really are and where they can fit in. Maybe give us a couple of examples of if you're struggling with boundaries and someone says, here's a role play. Say you don't want to go out to a concert this weekend, but your friend is like, I want to go out to a concert. Come on. We're going to have so much fun. We're going to da, 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 And everyone's going to be there. All the cool people are going to be there. You can sleep and do work some other time. Come to the concert, but you really don't want to come to the concert. So how are you going to say no and set a boundary that you don't want to come to the concert? So I will say that although this might not be the first step in therapy, I think that for listeners, this would be a great first step. When you think about that role play and you think about being the person who is being asked, maybe even pressured a little bit to do something you don't want to do, to go to the concert, notice how your body immediately begins to feel because you were telling this is a role play. This is not real. We're just chatting about an example, a hypothetical. I am already thinking about that dynamic and my chest, the core of my chest feels tight. It, I feel like I can't breathe as deeply. I am feeling tightness in my throat. I am feeling a sensation in my jaw, kind of like when you might could start crying, that sensation that you get in the jaw area. My body is already telling me, I don't want to do this. And I am scared about how to handle the situation. My body is, is reacting in a way that's giving me a lot of information. So to a listener, and this is also a therapeutic technique, but again, this will be further in the process. To a listener, just notice it. Notice what what is my body authentically saying? Because the book and, and other podcasts that you've done, other episodes, the body keeps the score gets mentioned several different times. The body does keep the score. The body is going to most of the time tell us what we want, what we feel without having the intellectualization. Our, our brain starts thinking about a million other things. So pay attention to what happens in the body. And when you identify that, then you can go ahead and decide, do I have a need and does someone else have a preference? So again, this kind of goes back to the examples we were talking about before, really thinking about, and, and my body is already starting to calm down as I talk myself through this. If I have a need to rest that night, or I have a need to be at one of my children's events, or I have a need to spend some time with my spouse, or I just want to binge watch some stuff on TV, that is maybe a real need. It may be a preference to my friend that they would really like me to join them at this concert. And so if it's a preference to them and I have a need, on the scale of what weighs more, a need weighs more than a preference. And so I think that, that we can start working ourselves through this in this way. And we can remember, and this is a Brene Brown quote, Clear is kind, unclear is unkind. So if I say to my friend, you know, let me think about it. I'm not really sure. You know, I'm, I may have something else going on, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Thanks for inviting me. Um, you know, 
and the whole time in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I'd rather lay in bed that night or I've got this other thing to do. That is unkind. It's not clear. It's not true. It's not authentic. It is manipulative. We don't like to say those words about ourselves because we think we're being nice, but those words are accurate. It is unclear and it is unkind. Be clear. If your body is saying no and your mind is him hawing or also wanting to say no, be clear. Hey, thanks for inviting me. That's not a great time for me. I'd love to talk about a concert with you later in the year. I'll talk to you later. Thanks so much. That's clear and it is kind. I love your phrase, my need and their preference. I love little snippets like that that I can kind of recite in my head. And I can envision myself if I was struggling in a moment, if I memorized that quote, and even if I didn't say anything out loud, if I thought, what is my need versus their preference? It's not their need. It's their preference. And what is my need? I I love that. Linda in episode five in self-care, and I, I learned about Boundaries book because I was in divorce care in a Southern church years and years ago. And in the divorce care program, the second six or eight weeks, I can't remember how long each section was, was on boundaries. And it was on that book. I often say I have a few things that I really wish everyone learned in middle school. One is I wish everyone learned boundaries and and how like a lot of the mechanisms that it talked in that book, regardless of the spiritual component of it, if we just take the core Absolutely. component. I wish they learned boundaries. I wish they learned DBT skills, dialectical behavioral therapy skills. And quite frankly, I don't want people to be addicts, but I really wish we learned the skills of the 12 steps and walking through all of those journeys and the healing component of it, because I just think it's it's so powerful. But that idea of my need versus their preference is, wow, like that really speaks to me. So I'm so glad that you shared that. And and going back to Linda, what I was thinking about in self-care, one of the tools that she uses as well, and I might say this to listeners, is she says if, if she's not sure what she really wants to do. So let's just say that I'm new in the therapeutic process. I'm not very good at identifying what my body is saying to me. I feel like I'm in the middle of the, of an answer is not to lie, but if you don't have to give an immediate response to something, then it is fine to say, I don't know the answer to this right now. Let me think about it and get back to you tomorrow. And that's not saying, yes, I want to do something or not. But if you don't know and you feel pressure in the moment and you're kind of taking baby steps into this, how do you feel about that type of a response? I think if it is true, it is absolutely okay. If, if you just don't know, you know, you just need to think about it and need to take a step back and identify what do I want here? What is a need and a preference? If it if it takes a little while to work yourself through that process, absolutely saying, I don't know. And I have told people many times and I learned this from a professor early in graduate school and it stuck with me and I've never forgotten it. Saying I don't know or not making a decision is a decision that that is an answer. It doesn't always have to be like you're saying yes or no. And that kind of gets us into a little bit of dialectical behavioral therapy that a lot of times we do want think we have to do one thing or another thing. And almost almost always there is a third option. And in this case, or a fourth option or a fifth option. Sometimes there's many options. But in this case, you're bringing up that third option, which is, I don't know, let me get back to you. Absolutely. okay. And especially if that is true, that's authentic. Love it. So what have we not shared with the audience today that you were really hoping we covered? So I think that people do not understand what the word codependency means. And so I would love to just spend a a minute on what that means. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it can mean lots of different things. And so I think I would like to explain what I mean when I'm saying that word, because codependency often is looked at as the partner of someone or the family member of someone who is in addiction. And so that addicted person is a dependent person on something, a substance, gambling, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is. And the partner or family member is dependent on that person in some way or the well-being of that person, or they need the person to be okay for them to feel okay. So they are, quote, a codependent. They are dependent with the person. That is only one piece. The codependency that I am talking about in this episode 
more moves toward the side of how we relate to others just in the overall picture. And so just to kind of quickly run through what those core traits would look like, it would be things like I have difficulty owning my own reality and identifying who I am. So I'm not really sure what Sharice likes or what she wants to do. Like you said in that in the concert example, I'm not I don't even really know. Do I want to go? Do I not want to go? I'm not even sure what the answer to that is. It's not easy for me to immediately identify it. So that would be an indicator. Having difficulty addressing my own adult needs and wants. And so then it's hard for me to do self-care because even if I do know what my needs and wants are, I have a very difficult time doing those things. So if I need to go get a haircut, well, that might cost me $40 and my kid really wanted that new game. And that's also $40. Oh, how do I spend that money? And so struggling in those ways, difficulties with my own self-esteem or self-love. Again, functioning in this type of a pattern, a lack of boundaries, a lack of ability to say no or not knowing how to say no or feeling a lot of guilt or distress when I do say no, that is going to absolutely chip away at my sense of self over time. And so my self-esteem is, if it wasn't already low before, it's going to become low over time with this type of relational style. The other piece of this is a lot of people pleasing. So people will come to therapy and they will say, I'm a people pleaser. Like they know that word and they know what that word means. They don't oftentimes know that that is a, can be a specific type of relational pattern that would be called codependency, caring versus caretaking. Do I care about you or do I caretake you? Because those are two different things. I can care about you and we got on this video call today and we met and I can maybe care about what you think or that, that I want you to perceive me well. That is okay. That's normal. But if I am caretaking, I might have emailed you two or three days ago and said, hey, you know, what, what color do you want me to wear? What what do you think I should say? Um, what tone of voice do you think would make the most sense? Because I am I am trying to caretake your needs so that you will like me. That's that's more than caring. That is, I am on some level making an attempt in a in kind of a loving way or what's perceived as a loving way to somewhat control the outcome or or get you to perceive me in a certain way. And so, again, a lot of these behaviors, there's a lot of social reward for them. Like society loves these behaviors. We get, you know, applauded for these behaviors. We're a great mom. We're a great spouse. We're a great worker. We're a great member of the organization or the church. And ultimately, there's lots of these people out here that are perceived in that way. And they are they are dying inside. They are miserable. They are depressed. They are anxious all the time. Their quality of life is getting worse by the by the month, by the year. And I see lots of these wonderful, beautiful people coming into therapy. They're just amazing people and they're hurting so much. And I've been there. I have been that person. I mean, it can lead you to the point of becoming suicidal or parasuicidal. This is not this is not just a lighthearted conversation. Boundaries is not just, oh, that's one of those words that therapists use and, you know, everybody talks about it. And it, it's, it's much more than that. It goes much deeper than that. And I know that we don't have the time to get into the trauma of this and, and maybe the root of where this comes from often. And you, some of your previous podcasts and episodes have covered some of those things also. So for the audience members, you know, definitely some of that's covered in, in earlier episodes. But if we're talking about things you can you can actively do, I think we've hit a lot of those points today. And a lot of it just has to start with awareness. It just has to start with being aware that these re- patterns of relating even exist and the problems that they can cause. I love the way you walked through the codependency component of it, because that even I just learned some new things and I thought I knew a lot about codependency. So thank you for that. Now, my final question, I have one final question and then I want you to repeat your quotes again because I like to kind of leave with those quotes because they're amazing. So my final question is, how can someone, if I know someone else is struggling with boundaries and they're trying to learn boundaries, how can I be more respectful of somebody else's boundaries? So what kind of tools can I use? For example, if I say, do you want to go to this concert? Da, 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 and you say no, then I say, okay, 
well, thanks for letting me know or, or something like that. How can I help somebody else who's struggling with boundaries and how can I be respectful of somebody else's boundaries? Your example was actually fantastic. The person needs to feel, especially at, at the beginning of this type of a journey of learning about boundaries, learning about recovering from possible codependence, if that's the way someone chooses to look at it, learning how to set and maintain boundaries. Most people can do this okay when they feel safe in a relationship. Most people can do this okay with at least one or two people in their life. So maybe their spouse, maybe their longest, oldest, best friend, maybe the person at work that they don't really like that much. So they don't really care if that, if that person likes them back. Most people have some area in their life where they're able to feel safe enough emotionally, physically, relationally to be authentic and just go, you know, no, I don't want to do that. So if you notice a friend or a coworker or somebody just seeming to feel kind of anxious whenever you ask them for help or they do him haw around a little bit. I'm not sure. Let me get back to you. Or you kind of just notice like a discomfort, just giving them the space to say no and, and maybe reassuring. And I would really like kind of focusing on that word, reassuring them. Hey, like either way is okay. You know, if you've got something else going on, truthfully, like this, it's, it's okay. If you can't go or you, you want to say no, I don't mind. Because I think the, the, the crux of this, if you're trying to help someone through this, is recognizing that their automatic default way of perceiving and thinking is, I need to do what makes this person happy at my own detriment. So to reassure them that I will like you, love you, be okay, no matter if you go or don't go, no matter if you say yes or no, that's very reassuring. And it creates a lot of relational safety for the person to be more honest, both with themselves and with you. One technique that I use when I'm asking someone for something is I'll say to this friend, okay, can you do whatever? You know, can you go grocery shopping for me tomorrow because I need to get this? And then I'll follow it with saying, and saying no is an completely appropriate response. And I find that the number of times I say that it's just amazing the way you I see that individual just kind of relax and then actually pause and say, OK, can I do this or can I not? By just going ahead and saying, if you can't, no problem at all. Just let me know. And I say that out loud on purpose to give them that ability to say, I'm still going to love you and be your friend or be in this relationship with you, even if you say no. That is fantastic. And I love the point that you're saying. A lot of times you can visibly see them relax. That's real. That's true. Because you just gave them an opportunity and you created safety that no is OK. Because they think no is not OK. Now, whether they think it in their mind or whether they think it in their body or their spirit or they think it from their spiritual beliefs it, it, or all of these. Right. Somewhere they think saying no is not OK. So now you have said saying no is OK. And if that is honest and true and they can feel that their body, again, will receive that information and then they can kind of get, get get back online. They're coming out of the phone response. They're getting back into a safe, regulated response. And then they can give you the answer that, that they need to give you or that they want to give you. Love it. So why don't you share your motivational quotes with us one more time before we end today? So per Cinderella, have courage and be kind. And the other one, and this has been a favorite of mine for a long, long time, is a master of patience is a master of everything else. I love that because I am by default not a very patient person, specifically when we're talking about the things that we're talking about today. And so to remind myself that if I will take this journey and learn to master patience and just waiting on things and letting myself rest and sit in things or not having to feel rushed to make a decision, Ultimately, I can be the master of all the other parts of my life at some point or another. And for me, that's very reassuring. And then I'll add in, remember to think about what your need is versus what their preference is. That is so powerful in boundaries. Thank you so much for your time today. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for having me. I've had a great time and I love the organization. I think the mission is amazing. I will continue to support it. And thanks again for allowing me to be here. You just listened to episode number 12 featuring our guest, Sharice. Together, we discussed boundaries, codependency, career changes, various therapeutic treatment needs and levels, some of our favorite books, and of course, our favorite quotes. 
As a reminder, the experiences and advice expressed in this episode are the hosts and guests' own personal stories and opinions. Rayan is passionate about opening the doors for all voices and experiences, not just those expressed in any particular podcast. If you want to share your experiences or expertise, we encourage you to be a future guest by emailing us at podcast at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org or submit a blog post by emailing blog at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org. In case you're wondering, every individual working with Ran does so on a 100% volunteer basis. All funds raised go to support the mission. So don't forget to love, not like our podcast and subscribe. When you subscribe and give us an awesome review, we are more likely to show up when someone is searching for topics such as these when they need healing or support. So please do it today. Not to mention, we have quite a few amazing guests booked for future episodes and you will not want to miss them. We hope you will also connect with us at www.recoveryadvocatenetwork.org where you can donate to the mission, read those blog posts, and stay in the loop about upcoming events, including our next fundraising auction to be held on October 26th through the 28th of this year. If you would like a sneak peek into some available items, contact donate at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org. Rumor is... Football legends such as Brett Favre and Eli Manning donated autographed footballs to help support the mission. So don't miss out on the opportunity to buy someone the perfect gift and help someone else who needs funds for their recovery. If you would like to donate items or service, email us. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Recovery Advocate Network and on Twitter at Ran to Wellness. If this episode was triggering to you, we encourage you to contact your support system, therapist, national and community support groups, the Global Crisis Text Line by texting 741-741 and or if in the United States dialing 988 to reach the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. If you wish to provide feedback, please feel free to leave comments on the episode or email us. Now, back to your coffee.